Now, this quagga foal is one of the 23 preserved ones worldwide. This museum obtained it in 1858. It was actually obtained as a live foal. We don't know how, but probably the mother was shot. They caught the foal, they tried to keep it alive, but that wasn't successful. After a few days, it died, and then it was skinned, and so the museum received it. Uh, it is the only one left on the African continent. The other 22 are all in European museums. There are a few skeletons and loose skulls, which are probably outside Europe. That the quagga became extinct um, was really an accident. And I think one of the main reasons, obviously all big game in the quagga's distribution area, being the Karoo and the Southern Orange Free State, they have been quite ruthlessly hunted because they were seen as grazing competitors to the farmer's livestock. Um, but if it had been realized that the quagga was near extinction, I believe efforts would have been made to save it, as efforts were made to save the Cape Mountain zebra, which was once very close to extinction. And also considering that the Bontebok was already given legal protection in, in the 1820s, because it was realized that it was very rare, I am sure the quagga would have been saved had it been realized. That it has not been realized was caused by its name. The name quagga, which was adopted by the settlers from the Hottentot-speaking original inhabitants of the Quachas distribution. It's really an imitation of the animal's call. All plain zebras, when they get excited, they make this Quachas-like call. And unfortunately, many people use that term Quacha as an Afrikaans equivalent to the English word zebra. And therefore, since a long time and still today, many Afrikaans-speaking people refer to any zebra as a quagga. And so when the quagga, which science knows as a quagga, had become extremely rare on the verge of extinction, um, some people might have said so. We have no more quaggas in our area, but others would have said, ah, we got thousands. But in the meantime, they were talking about different subspecies and not the true quagga. So that it had actually disappeared was only realized early this century. It is interesting, too, that a few years after the quagga had become extinct, which was in 1883 when the very last mayor died in the zoo in Amsterdam, in Holland, it was given legal protection, but it was too late. But it hadn't been realized at the time that there were none left. So I, I, I'm going to ask you a few questions. We'll just do it in little sections. Mm -hmm. So my first question was, <clears throat> so what, what were quagga and where were they found? Yeah, the quagga, it has long been debated, was it a species on its own or was it a subspecies of the plain zebra, often referred to as Birchall zebra? And zoologists were divided on this. And since the quagga was no longer alive, it was always thought also that this question would probably never be answered. Because the, the, the old criteria to divide uh, animals into separate species or subspecies is when they breed with each other, whether their offspring is fertile or infertile. If the offspring is infertile, the parents are considered to belong to two separate species. If the offspring is fertile, then even if they may look different from each other, they're still part of the same species. So the quagga lived largely in the inland of South Africa. It's usually said the Karoo and the Southern Free State. Because of the confusion which the name has caused, it is difficult to determine from old traveling reports and diaries from the last century and earlier when there is talk of quaggas, whether they were in fact true quaggas or any other zebra. If there is talk of quaggas at the Victoria Falls, this is one incident I'm thinking of now. Thomas Baines traveled from Walfish Bay inland to the Victoria Falls. And near the Victoria Falls, he talks of quaggas. Now there it's very clear they were not what science calls a quagga. They were 
most likely uh, other populations of the plain zebra. But if it is in the critical area, say north of the Orange and Fall rivers, which is considered to be roughly the boundary of the Quajas distribution, the northern boundary, then one cannot be sure were they now really meaning the true Quajar or its nearest uh, relatives, the true Birchall zebra, which is also extinct. How, how does Quajar get its name? Yeah, one has to see that in the historical context, the settlement here in South Africa, the European settlement started in 1652. The first zebra the settlers became familiar with was the Cape Mountain zebra, which they called the Wilde Part or the Wilde Esel, or the Restrepte Esel, various terms were used. And as they expanded over the Cape Folded Mountains and came into the Karoo, they met this animal, which was new to them. They knew it had some contact uh, with the mountain zebra, but it wasn't the same. And the indigenous people referred to it as a quacha. And the quacha is quite obviously an imitation of the plain zebra's call. If you go to any reserve now where there are plain zebras and a mare is looking for a foal or whatever else excitement is there, you hear that call, quacha, quacha, quacha. So that is where the name comes from. Um. And how, you know, what caused the demise of Quaha? Well, if you have been to the Karoo, you know that grass is very scarce there, has been for a long time. And the farmers, of course, brought their sheep and goats, and they saw all the grazing animals as unwanted competitors to their livestock. I think this is, besides the uh, confusion which the name caused, the main reason for them having been ruthlessly hunted. But what is often overlooked is the fact that not only the quacha has been hunted, any big animal which, which was a grazer was hunted quite mercy, mercilessly. And by the time the last quacha died in Amsterdam in 1883, not only was the quacha gone from the Karoo, but kudu and springbok and chemsbok and wildebeest, any grazing animals, or any animals which the farmers saw as competitors to their livestock, were just as much hunted. The only difference is that a kudu in the Karoo didn't really look any different from a kudu, say, in the Krüger Park. And the same is true for Hemsbok or Springbok. And therefore, um, that the kudu was wiped out and the chemspok was wiped out in the Karoo didn't appear as tragic as that the quacha has wiped out, was wiped out because the quacha looks so different from its northern relatives. That is, some of them look very different. Others, again, are very close to it. What is the difference between the quacha and the plain zebra? Well, it is usually taken that the quacha was a brownish animal which had stripes only in the front half of its body. If one looks at the 23 preserved specimens in various museums, then of course it's very obvious that no two are the same. The individual variation was in this 23 and probably was in the original entire population, was as great as it is in southern plain zebras of today, whether you look in Zululand or in, in the Transvaal or in Namibia, you will always find that even within a family group, no two are the same. Some are heavier striped right down to the hoofs and others are not. So the quacha was known as a brownish animal, and I especially say brownish because the brown was also variable. It is quite evident from the preserved ones and also from uh, illustrations which were made of live quachas that they were not all of the same tone of brown. Some were lighter, some were darker. Some were heavier striped, some were less uh, striped. In some animals, the clear stripes really end already before the shoulder, leaving only head and neck clearly striped, while in others, the stripes go till behind the shoulder, and there they become more faint. And in others, they go right up to the rump. So there's tremendous variation. Enormous variation. Mm. Um, and um, what made you think that quacha was not a distinct species and was not, in fact, extinct? Well, uh, living in this country and seeing every now and then the southern populations of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the plains, uh, 
living in this country and seeing the southern populations of the plain zebra uh, fairly often, be that in Namibia, the Etosha Reserve, or in the Transvaal, or Zululand, or Swaziland, and knowing also, or having seen all the, except one, all the preserved kwachas, the only one I haven't seen is the one which is in Russia, all the others I have seen, and not just looked at, but examined the state of preservation, measured them, took photographs, and so on. And comparing what lives today with these stuffed specimens in museums, um, and especially seeing the enormous variation in the preserved specimens, that idea has to actually come that if one were to uh, select out of the living populations the most quacha-like specimens and breed with them, it might be possible to increase these quacha characteristics. In other words, reduce the striping even more than what it is, and perhaps also darken the brown. And that brought about the idea. But it isn't really my idea all alone. Previous people have expressed similar thoughts, but it had never been started until we now started it. Excuse me. You know, perhaps, you know, Quacha um, could be bred, but what led, you know, what was the conclusive piece of work that you did to sort of prove that they were, in fact, a subspecies? I'm thinking about when you discovered the connective tissue. Well, <coughs> um, I visited various museums in Europe which house Quachas, as I said, and I have had a good look at 22 of the 23, and that was in 1971. And at that time I discussed it also with one of the zoologists in Germany, and he thought that uh, such a project should in fact be started. And when I tried to get some interested people together in 1975, it was very difficult. Some people thought it was a good idea and when I say people, I mean zoologists. While others thought it didn't really make sense. The quacha is extinct. We know too little about it, whether it was a species or a subspecies. And uh, if it was a species, obviously, then any attempt to rebreed it would not make sense. Because if a species is extinct, it is extinct. If it was, however, a subspecies, in other words, one local form within a species, then that is a different story, then the main gene pool is still there. And um, now the zoologists were divided worldwide. Some took it as a species as it was originally described, and others thought more likely that it would, be, would have been a subspecies. So in 75, 1975, I tried to get interested people together, but it took until 1987 before we had a group of people together, some influential people, who all supported the idea. And then uh, the first animals were caught in 1987 in March in the Etosha Park. That's bad. And this Sorry, so we'll just try to pick up, but there was obviously a lot of um, you know, skepticism about yeah. the, the quarter. Yeah, right. But, um, when it was this particular animal, when you were um, restuffing them? Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Okay, you want me to and start what, with yeah. that? Yeah, and oh. what did you just, you know, what did you find? Mm. And, and mm. What did that lead to? Mm. Well, in 1969, uh, the director and myself decided that we should try and do something to our quacha fowl, which was in a very crude way stuffed in 1859-58, thereabout. And it was moth-eaten, and it, it, it really looked awful, and yet it was such a valuable specimen, irreplaceable specimen. So after doing some experiments with other old skins, in 1969 we felt ready to risk dismantling the specimen and remounting it. And as I took it apart, or rather took the stuffing out and softened the skin, the inside had not been cleaned at all. There were still bits of muscle attached and blood vessels with a residue of blood and so on. And all that had to be removed, of course, in order to get that skin a little softer and uh, tan it and all that. 
And of course, normally, whatever one shaves off the flesh side of a skin is off fallen, gets discarded. But dealing here with an extinct animal, I, I just couldn't discard it. I kept it in the hope that one day it might even be possible to use this material to try and solve this question, was the quaha a species or a subspecies? So I kept it carefully, and every now and then I mentioned it to molecular biologists and so on, but everybody thought it is far too old. There is nothing, no structures left. Uh, it might as well be discarded, but I didn't discard it. And then in 1980, by chance, I mentioned this material to a geneticist at San Diego, uh, at the University of California, and he was excited when I mentioned to him that I would have some dry quaha flesh and even residue of blood. And so some material was sent to him. And when he looked at it and saw the condition of it, he was surprised at the good condition. And he passed on little portions of it to two other scientists. And all three worked on it. And then they uh, actually succeeded in isolating fragments of the quaha's DNA which was quite revolutionary because it was thought generally that DNA would not stay intact uh, long after the death of an individual. And here we dealt with a skin which was 150 years old and the DNA was surprisingly still in quite good condition. They managed to clone it as well and then compare it with other zebras, first with other mammals, with a cow and whatnot, and finally with zebras. And that was f uh, then showing clearly that the quaha was in fact not a species, but a subspecies of the plain zebra. Now, when these results were published in the early 1980s, that of course lent support to the quaha project. When we started in, eight, in uh, 78, we did so against a lot of opposition. And it could well have happened that this DNA analysis would have shown that the quaha was a species, and then we would have had to stop our efforts, because then it wouldn't make sense. But fortunately, it turned out that this DNA analysis and also blood protein uh, analysis, which was done by one of the three scientists, all showed that the quaha was, in fact, a subspecies. <coughs> from an extinct animal. Being an extinct animal, every bit of it is valuable. A single hair of it is valuable because you cannot replace it. Isn't that so? So I kept this rubbish in the hope that it might one day be useful. Unfortunately, it turned out this way. You know, which leads me to the, my one, another question is that clearly you're very passionate about quacha. And where did this passion for quacha come from? Well, I, I don't know if I am passionate for quacha. I've been so much involved with it. You see, when I arrived here as a taxidermist in, from Germany in 1959, and I saw this quacha uh, in its dreadful condition, just shoved between other animals, which looked more like a storeroom than an exhibit, I, I thought, hey, such a valuable specimen should get better treatment than that. But of course, I was hesitant also because in order to do something to it, it has to be wetted. You have to get water into the skin. Obviously not just water with germicides and, and various other chemicals, but even so, it is a risky business. You don't know how that skin reacts. It might dissolve. It might break into pieces. So although I, I had to look at it in its awful state ever since the end of 59 until 69, um, I wasn't prepared to risk it. But only after discovering some other old skins in the corner of a storeroom, which were also 50, 60 years old, and I could work with those and try out softening uh, ways and chemicals, we felt confident, the director and myself, we will now risk it. And obviously I risked it very gently. I softened one foot just above the hoof to see how that skin reacted. And when uh, that worked well, I went up a little higher on the leg and finally the entire specimen. So ever since that time, and obviously, I mean, being a taxidermist, one is very interested in natural history. And Noya yeah, zebras, together with the quacha, perhaps lately 
have a little more of my attention than, than some other mammals. But I don't know if I can call that a passion. But it seems to me, you know, as a taxidermist, your work is all concerned with the, with the dead. You know, you're remounting these animals. Uh. But it seems to me unusual that someone who's a taxidermist would then pursue with passion, you know, this breeding mm. program to mm. actually have something living. I mm. think that's quite special. I mean, what motivated you really to see, you know, if something could be done? You know, what was your personal motivation? Yeah, you see, in order to be a taxidermist, you've got to have an enormous interest in the living animals. Because how can you recreate a dead body to look like a live animal if you don't know what the live animal is like? And as I said already, as a taxidermist, one has naturally uh, interest in, in animals or in natural history altogether. And with that comes that one feels sad about any life form to have become lost through man's ignorance. And I suppose that was a motivation. I saw a chance of possibly rectifying one of the mistakes which mankind made by bringing the quacha to extinction after knowing the preserved quachas and knowing the live animals and knowing how close they approach each other. That is what brought it about. Um. Okay. Um. Um, I'm just thinking. Can you just um, can you explain how you came to go to all those museums to to see? I mean, did you finance it out of your own pocket, or did you go on a like on a study thing, or mm. how did, was quite a mission. How did that actually mm. happen? Mm. After I successfully remounted this quacha foal, I was of course curious to know what the others might be like. Are there any others perhaps which are falling to pieces? And then I discussed it with our director and fortunately some money could be made available for me to go to Europe and visit all these museums. They're all fairly close by, it's all Western Europe. Uh, the biggest amount are in Germany, nine. Then England has a few, Switzerland has one, Italy has two, and France has two, and a few other countries. Sweden has got one other foal. So it was fairly easy, really, to travel within two weeks from museum to museum and see them all. Um, and then, no, yeah, that's how it came about. I've forgotten part of your question. You wanted to know uh, how I came to see the others. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. I, I mean, that's like explained it then. Yeah. The like, other thing is you made up from all the reference books and all the various sources, you'd made up that chart of all the quachas in the yeah. world, which, yeah. which I think is marvelous. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's not from reference books, that's from my own publication. You see, after my trip in 71, I published the revised list of all the quacha material preserved in the world's museums. Because there was a list published by a Polish author, which published in 1949, just after the war, but it referred to the situation before the war. Uh, him being behind the Iron Curtain, he had no way of knowing what quacha material might have survived in the West. Therefore, what he published in 1949 referred to the situation before the Second World War. And after I had traveled to all the quachas um, and checked on the records of their specimens and so on, it was quite obvious that his list needed updating. So in 1974, uh, in our annals here, a regular scientific publication, I published the so-called revised list of the preserved material of the quacha. And uh, after that, a few more uh, specimens connected to the quacha came to light. <coughs> One complete quacha, in fact, was discovered, which had so far escaped uh, the scientific literature, and that is at the Museum in Lyon in France. 
That was then included and a foot turned up somewhere in England, which is said to be a quachas foot. It's very difficult to prove. But it was mounted as a quachas foot that is at the Exeter Museum somewhere in England. So in 1978, it came to the additions to the list of the preserved quacha material, also published in the annals. And from those illustrations or the photographs which were published, I should have said that list includes a photograph of each specimen, photographs which I have taken while I visited them all. And from those photographs, I then uh, put together in a poster form the entire 23 animals. In fact, 24 are there, because the one quacha which got lost because of World War II, at the end of World War II, in Königsberg, which is now part of Russia, it was that time part of Germany, that is destroyed, but photographs of it were published in 1912. So I reproduced those photographs to make the picture complete. We can now see at a glance how different the animals are one from another without having to, to um, refer to various publications and page around and see one quacha here, another one somewhere else. You see it at one view. Um. Preserve what's living, you know. Yeah. The quaker project's kind of unique. Yeah. So, what connection do you see, or how do you see the connection between the quaker project and nature conservation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The nature conservation bodies um, are also struggling to get the necessary finance to try and protect endangered species. It's an ongoing problem. And they feel that the quacha is extinct, and some are still not convinced that it was, in fact, not a species of its own. They feel that they must rather put every effort in preventing further species from becoming extinct. That is a view uh, which we can understand. But at the same time, we feel that as far as we so far know, and there seems very little doubt that uh, it is correct that the quacha was not a species, but a subspecies. And therefore, the possibility is there to rectify a mistake which was made during the last century by bringing it to extinction. And then we would compare that to efforts like reintroducing the Arabian oryx into Arabia from captive stock, or reintroducing the European wild horse, or the, the wild ancestor of the horse, the Shevalsky horse into Mongolia. These are things which are actually happening and which prove successful. So we see it in a way comparable to this. Uh, but each one is entitled <coughs> sorry, to his own view. Some wouldn't agree. Some would say still now that what we are doing um, doesn't really make sense. Um, why, why, well, I want to pick this up later, but is this a Jurassic Park story? Is it? Uh, did you say people, is it? Yeah, people like to think that it, that it, yeah. it is, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it is definitely not a Jurassic Park story. Uh, although the discovery of fragments of DNA of the quacha somehow make it sound a little bit similar. But we are not doing any genetic engineering or any cloning or any such um, intricate things. We are simply selecting animals which have similarities to the extinct quacha, and we put them together so that they would produce offspring. And out of that offspring, we will always select again the most quacha-like, and we'll put them so together that they will breed with each other. This particular stallion will breed with this mare because they have no other choice. So we always have to pick them out of our five groups of zebras which are living now near Cape Town and start a new group somewhere. That is all we are doing, nothing at all uh, similar to Jurassic Park. We will eventually, hopefully finances allow, resort to perhaps artificial insemination and embryo transplant. 
that is definitely envisaged. Once we have reached the stage that we have, say, one pair, which are absolutely comparable to perhaps the less typical of the quachas, the heavier striped ones of the preserved quachas, then we want to speed up the process. We don't want to wait uh, three years to produce two folds in the natural way. Then we might well flush an embryo in a mare, in this particular mare, and transfer it into a surrogate mare, which could be another zebra or a horse or even a donkey. And the, the mother of that embryo will be able to produce the next embryo within a few months. And we might get out of this one pair, not one foal, in 13, 14, or 15 months, but three or four. That we might eventually do. But even that has nothing to do with Jurassic Park. I mean, artificial insemination, embryo transplant is, is quite a common thing nowadays. Not only in humans, in, in animals as well. Is the quaha still a mystery? I wouldn't say it is a mystery. The quaha is not just one uniform thing as we... S what is the, the, the exciting potentially about this project in the future? You still don't know yet. The reason why we are doing it is, as I said already, to try and rectify a mistake which was made in the last century. But also, while in the last century exterminating the larger animals in the inland of South Africa was the order of the day, now the opposite is really the order of the day. Farmers are very keen to restock their farms with game. This has to do with hunting and the money it brings, but even so it is a fact that farmers are very keen to stock their farms again with game. And if a farmer in the Karoo, in the former area of the Quacha, wants zebras, there are no quachas he can put there. He would have to put zebras there as they occur further north. And we feel that if we manage to produce animals which are comparable to the preserved quachas, such animals are much better suited to be introduced into farms which are in the area where the quacha used to occur. But do you know at this point whether you're going to end up with something like the fall behind you? No, we don't know that. We are confident that we will, but we do not know. We don't know if we're said, going to have. We don't know that. You, you, oh, oh, you oh. Say, we don't know that we'll land up with. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, I don't think I want to say it that way. Mm -hmm. um, Since we are doing no genetic manipulations, we are simply breeding naturally folds of animals which we have selected. We feel confident that with each successive generation, we should narrow down the, the built-in variation in the Southern Plains zebras more and more in the direction towards the quacha, and that we should eventually end up with animals which are very similar to this animal. When this will happen, nobody can say. Um, it is quite obvious from our breeding, and we keep strict records, that even one pair of zebras produce five folds, and all five look different from each other. Some might have unstriped legs, and some have striped legs right down to the hooves from the same parents. So it is a gamble. It could happen any day, any next foal could be very similar to this. We don't expect that, it would be an enormous step, but it could also still take 20, 30 or 50 years. Nobody knows. We hope it will happen fairly rapidly. We have just gotten into the second generation now. Only one foal has so far been born of the second generation. During this summer, we expect a few more. When they are sexually mature, which will be five years if it's, if it's a stallion, and we breed those animals, then we probably make a bigger step than we have so far been making. But all this, we do not know. We can only hope for the best. But we are confident. That's great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, this is buzz track for Hocker interview with Ryan Holt at the museum.
Thank you. Such a disc or something. I turned a little bit, so I find the birds are close as I can, yeah. I'm just doing the look full animal. No, it's nice because all three of them face the same way, and we have that like, other one, love. Yeah. So you can actually go up to me. Thanks a lot. Thanks, George. Thank you.
And then the softening, taking apart, taking all the stuffing out and so on. And then they have the skin, working on the skin, and mounting a skeleton of that zebra fowl which they shot for me at the Krieger Park, that is the heavier striped one of the two fowls. Making an armature, making the new model, casting and fitting the skin. Do you think that will work? Yeah. Um. I will obviously have to get rid of my cigarette. Oh, are you filming already? Mm hmm. Ay, ay, ay. We don't waste any time. But maybe what we could do is we could do that again. We can maybe flag this. I'll take that right out. I'm going to fall over it. Go there and get it and explain what it is, that this is what chronicles, you know, yeah. the process that you went with the original right. Now, here we have some photographs of the remounting of the Cape Town Fowl. This is uh, the way it used to be ever since it was originally stuffed in 1858 or 9. We're not quite sure at which year. Another two fuse. And then here the softening of the specimen, soaking it in some water with various chemicals till the seams could be opened and then finally taking it apart and then finding what was the situation inside just a few bits of wire which held it together and then loose filling. But the foot bones were in the leg still and also the skull, which during this work then um, uh, became available now for study, you see. I used the foot bones and the skull, of course, to make my new model, but for comparison I had this zebra foal of which you see the skeleton here mounted and I made this model first as a guide for the Quacha model. And here we have the armature including the skull and the foot bones which came out of the stuffed specimen and the rest of the support needed for the clay model. And here is a complete model over which then the skin was fitted. And the skin of course still retaining its old shape no more elasticity like in a fresh skin. It has to be forced to take the new shape till it is dried out. This is why there is all this bandaging. How long does that take? 
Uh, that stretches over several months, but one doesn't work on it continuously, you see, trying to get the skin soft. It soaks in chemicals, various different mixtures and so on. So it's difficult to say in hours exactly how long it takes. These are the bones which came out of the stuffed animal, which are now in the collection. And here the head as it used to be and as it is now. So the shape could be improved a little bit, but the main aim was to make sure it doesn't deteriorate any further that it retains and remains forever after. Oh, that would be it. Now here we have a skin, wet, in the process of being tanned of a zebra foal in size very similar to the quaha, which has been preserved but not yet tanned. And if you look at it here, this is the way it comes off when you skin it. There's a lot of connective tissue and bits of fat and so on attached to the flesh side of the skin. And that all has to be removed. Here is whole bits of, of muscle still attached. It has to be removed. It's called fleshing in tanning terms till the skin is much thinner than it was and all this disturbing tissue is removed that it can then uh, be fitted onto the model. And the quacha skin, when the quacha was dismantled, it wasn't neat like this. It was really in this condition. And not even skinned as neatly. There was much more connective tissue and, and muscle still attached to it. And that is what I saved in 1969. Now, what, what chemicals, can you describe what happens when you, when you actually put the tan it? Well, tanning means that the the protein of which the skin is made, the collagen, is combined with some uh, many different types of tanning chemicals. And that turns it from a perishable substance into a non-perishable substance. Uh, chrome salts are used, aluminium salts are used, uh, even plant extracts, many, many different methods of tanning. Um, this has so far been preserved with salt and a little bit of aluminium salt. But once it is fleshed and the skin is ready, it will be tanned, in this particular case, with a certain aluminium salt. Not the same which has been preserving it. It will be something else and then it will be given so-called fat liquor, which is a synthetic uh, fat, which soaks into the wet skin and lubricates the fibrous structure of it so that when it dries out eventually on the mannequin, it won't dry rock hard, it will retain some softness. And if it were to be tanned as a skin, even a fur skin for a fur coat or so, then of course you want it to remain soft even after it is dry. And you discovered when you opened it up, and yeah. just to say how, you know, when they were mounted. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, the quacha skin arrived here from the Beaufort West area, in 1858 in more or less this condition but dried out. It was just heavily salted and dried and probably parceled together and was sent here. And the taxidermist then, I wasn't there obviously, I don't know, I can only guess, he had to re-soak it again by putting it into water. He may have used salt, he may have used some other things with it, we don't know that. He had to get it into this condition again. But then he didn't uh, really flesh it, it wasn't done at this time. The demands on mounted animals were not what they are today. As long as that animal stood on its four feet again and looked somewhat like an animal, that was good enough. So he made his metal supports, put the skin over and stuffed it full with hemp and straw and just anything on hand really, sewed it up and that was it. Different bars with different chemicals. They combined with 
Now, from all the things standing around, I guess you can see we are here in the taxidermy department where all the work for the exhibitions and also for the study collections is taking place. So let's go have a look at the records we keep of our breeding. These are by now outdated charts, but this is how we started off. Uh, they are still quite interesting. The color um, quality of the photographs is not the best, but we have here a certain stallion, they all have names, which we need for the stud book, and a mare. And out of this pair, we had by 1994, these five folds. And um, I don't know if you can see it there, the first fold was quite disappointing because it got completely striped legs, which none of the parents have. We certainly expected better than that. But the next fold, was totally different. It has nice unstriped legs from the same parents. And then another one which in, is sort of in between these two. And the next here, re, uh, resembling the mother perhaps quite a bit, not as brown as the father. That shows very clearly already with this five folds from the same parents, how unpredictable the whole thing is. But we are confident that with successive generations, we will make this degree of variation less and less in the direction of the quacha, obviously, which means out of each generation, we will always pick the best, and best means the nearest to the quacha. And then by breeding with those, we will eventually uh, produce animals which resemble the parents very much or even get better than the parents. And besides this here for easy reference, we keep, of course, a stud book um, where each animal is entered. No, this is not upside down. Doesn't matter, I just open it anywhere. Not one of the best animals. This is quite a good young stallion. Of each animal, we have the name, the parents, when the animal was born, if it was born in the project, or where else it originates from, caught here or caught there, and when. And then, four photographs showing both sides and a front and a back view of the animal. And then any further interesting uh, data get entered here. And at the back, we enter the offspring of this particular animal. How, how many animals are there now in the project? There are now 52 or 53. It changes now during the summer months quite rapidly because we have quite a few mares which are close to giving birth. So if I say now 53, I may already be out of date because the foal was born this morning, of which I don't know yet. But it's around there, early 50s now. So how many generations are you into the breeding program? We are just now in the second generation, the beginning of the second generation. One foal has been born in the second generation. Um, I may be able to show you this foal. If, if this stud book, this stud book actually belongs to another committee member, which is Professor Heidenreich. Um, I am not sure if it's quite up to date yet. No, it isn't quite up to date. I thought I could show you a photograph of that animal. If I grab the other stud book, I can show you a photograph of that foal if you wish to see. This is 
is it here. We haven't got a name for him yet. We also are not too sure yet whether it's a male or a female. It seems to be a male. As you can see, it is no better really than some of our other animals which are of the first generation, which in itself is again a little bit disappointing. But being second generation, he ought to or she ought to have a higher concentration of the quagga genes than its parents. And I thought I had a better photograph of the young thing here as well. As you can see, I'm also not quite up to date here. Yeah, this is the mare with her foal. They still have to be cut and added into the um, start book. There you get a nice view of it. And how many generations do you think it will take before you'll see? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It might happen quick. It might take quite a few more generations. As you have seen here, uh, one cannot predict what the foal would look like. And we might have animals very quickly which are comparable with the less typical of this 23 on that poster. But it might also take a few more generations. We hope it won't take too long, because we don't last forever. And I'd like to see the first Kracha. <coughs> Say that again. Yeah, you were saying that in terms of the breeding pro program that you've accomplished so far, it's, it's more the, the sort of bottom two rows that you've got to. Yeah. It's like this is a sort of measuring stick. Yeah. In this picture here, the quachas have been sorted according to least striped and most striped. The least striped ones being at the top and the heaviest striped ones at the bottom. And some of these animals in the bottom row have actually been discussed in the, in the literature of the early part of this century as to whether they belong to the quacha or to the next northern uh, variety or subspecies, the true Birchell zebra. So one can argue about it. But it also serves to show that from the least striped to the heaviest striped and beyond to the animals as we have them now, and further up in Africa, right up to Kenya, there seem to be no sharp divisions between the various subspecies. And some of the animals in our breeding project, as far as the striping is concerned, or the reduced striping, they are more or less comparable to that four animals there at the bottom row. This year. Which one? This one. This is the southern continuum. Yeah. And then there is an unborn foal, a fetus, at the Mainz Museum in Germany. And the oldest of them all is this most crudely stuffed foal, which the famous uh, Swedish traveler Sparman has taken to Sweden, I think, in 1775, thereabout. So this is the oldest of the stuffed quachas in existence.
that smoke might be disturbing. Five again. And row six, last row. What's that? No, it's okay. No, it's okay. You get it. Right, I get it. <coughs> now, here, we have a picture where all the 23 preserved kochas plus the one which got lost during World War II, this one here, are put together for easy reference before one had to get a whole stack of publications out of various libraries perhaps to see each kocha. Now at one look you have the whole lot and you get an idea of the variation from individual to individual. So that has proved very useful. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Off you go. Now, we have said there are 23 quachas preserved in various museums. This picture includes 24. The first one in the fifth row, the one on the left there, that got destroyed at the end of World War II. How did it get destroyed? We don't know the details. It all happened, uh, you know, in what was then the Russian-occupied area. I have heard some stories, but I don't know how reliable they are. Like most museums, ex um, evacuated their most precious possessions during the war uh, out of the cities into old castles or, or places which were considered safe. That kocha was also taken out of the city of Königsberg into some castle, but somehow at the very end of the war, it got lost, burned, I believe. Yeah, yeah. 
yeah, they're filming everything they see. They're filming everything they see. <laughs> this is the Kwaka, circa 1893, uh, Samuel Daniel. Daniel. For the Society in November 1962 by the Cape Town Limited. The artist is Samuel Daniel, D-A-N-I-E-L-L. Okay, this is buzz track for the taxidermy department general. This is buzz track for Reinhold's office in the taxidermy department, thank you. Thank you. Let's see with the uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We should have done this late in the day uh, after a couple of rum and cokes, probably. Now, I can tell you one thing if we take a few shots, yes, don't even ask me the questions. I'll just. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not nervous or something like that. No. I just hate to make a fool of myself. Yeah, that's I won't let you do that. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> what, Pierre, interests you about the, the Quaker story? I would say probably the uh, Indian cobra. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was pulling your leg. <coughs> So just remember to use my, my question and your answer. Okay. <coughs> what is it? Well, sorry, what's that other word? Re retrieve. 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 
What's interesting to me about the Quaha uh, is the fact that it was on the edge of extinction, but uh, at the end of the day it was retrieved back to normal natural life. Okay, let's cut there because that, that's not quite accurate. So Pierre, what do you...